Hi, I'm Colonel Jim Adams, and I'm here to help you save your life. And none of you probably believe that right now, but before you leave here today, I, th I think you will. Now, first, let's get it clear what I am and what I am not. I am not a sociologist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not one of those fuzzy-wuzzy guys that you sometimes hear about and have some anxiety about. I am a soldier. I'm a professional engineer. I've been in management jobs all my career, and I'm also a victim of stress. And that's why we're going to talk about that particular insidious disease that's one of the biggest killers in our society today. $34 billion are lost off of our gross national product every year to stress illnesses and deaths. $34 billion. That's as much as the Army budget and greater than the Army budget for all but two years of our history. A number of those other statistics are important, too. Almost a quarter of a million people under the age of 65 die every year of stress-related heart attacks. Those are people that could stay around a little bit longer, but don't. Can we afford that? Well, we don't want any of you to be that number. Look at the number of days we lost to ulcers. 14 million workdays lost to ulcers. The Corps of Engineers is very proud of a number of achievements. Transcontinental Railroad, Panama Canal, Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, Capitol Building, Manhattan Project, World War II, produced the atomic bomb. None of those things took 14 million workdays. And to something as simple as ulcers, we're giving up that kind of a cost. And wife beating and child abuse in our American society, our national disgrace. We're the leader in that category of all the civilized nations. And in the Army, we're the leader in our society. And it's all due to this little thing called stress. And what is it? Well, we're going to use an engineer definition, because that's really what it is. Every time you exert a force on any object, including your body, the force is like taking a rubber ball in my hand and squeezing it. The squeeze is the force. But something else happens. The rubber ball will change shape. It will deform under the pressure of that force. And we call that strain, that deformation. Now, if I were to hold a rubber ball long enough and let go, it would not return to its spherical shape. I would exceed its limit. And it would never be perfectly round again. And any item or body placed under stress long enough, the strain that is induced will become permanent. And permanent damage will last. Now, your body is a very complex chemical, biological operating system. Every thought that you have, every movement that you make, is the result of a complex sequence of chemical, biological events. And you were designed to live off of stress. In fact, it takes some stimulus or force to even get you going in the morning. So not all stress is bad. We're designed to take all kinds of stress for short periods of time. And there are some stresses that are particularly dangerous. Those are the ones that cause the biggest impact to this biological system we have. And let me illustrate that, how it was designed in us. You're walking down the street and about to step off the curb. Out of the corner of your eye, you see a vehicle hurtling towards you. It takes no conscious thought. Your body is already equipped to defend yourself. The equivalent of a general alert is sounded, and immediately certain biological things start taking place. You will feel your pulse quicken, your heart beat stronger. You'll feel your respiratory system increase. You'll start breathing deeper and faster. Adrenaline is pumped into your blood, so you can actually feel that surge of energy, and you leap out of the way. And the car hurdles past. You see that you're safe, and you reverse that mechanism. You give yourself an all clear. In about five minutes, your breathing rate, your heartbeat will return to normal, and all those chemical changes that also took place will return to normal. You were designed to do that. That's how you defend yourself. But in our modern society, we sometimes perceive threats around us that don't go away. And we gear up to defend ourselves and charge on all day long one layer of aggravation and threat on top of the other and don't get an all clear. Therefore, the body doesn't get a chance to go back to normal. And if you prolong that strain, all those things that have gone on long enough, permanent damage ensues. Now, there are only two types of stress that are always harmful. And those are the ones that we're going to talk about today. If you can deal with these, you're going to save your own life. Because these are the killers. They're anger and anxiety. You all know what anger is, particularly that kind of explosive anger where somebody blows his top and 
You've all seen that happen, and you've all done it yourselves. There are many forms of anger, though. One of them is very subtle, and we call that frustration. Now, frustration is a good term. It even sounds kind of aggravating. And what's good about this description of it is that it actually shows you how it prolonged that anger is. Frustration occurs when you're aggravated about something and you can't deal with it. It doesn't go away. It just kind of stays in there like a burr under the saddle and irritates you and irritates you hour after hour, day after day, month after month. And we call it frustration because, in fact, you can't get rid of the darn thing. It just sticks around. That is a form of anger one of the most dangerous forms. Now, anxiety, I think you all understand. That's that nervousness, that apprehension you feel when something's about to happen and you don't know how the outcome's going to be. We always know that every time there's a change of something, that we're either going to be better off or worse off, but we don't know in advance which one that's going to be. So we're apprehensive. We treat it as a threat. Now, both of those emotions are so strong in us for the purpose of defending ourselves. See, Mother Nature had to program some sequence to give us the cue to gear up to really make that maximum effort. So she chose two emotions to start this sequence of events. One of them is anger, and one of them is fear. Anxiety is a form of fear. Okay, those are the two forms of stress that we're going to pay most attention to. Now, to be a stress casually, to be a victim, three things have to happen coincidentally. First, you have to have a stress. Something's got to make you angry or afraid. Secondly, it has to be relevant to you. That's what context means. It has to be in the context of some personal life situation that makes it relevant. Something that pulls your chain may totally unaffect me. So that's what makes this very personal. And thirdly, you have to have a vulnerability. It's also a physical rule that in any body under stress, the weakest link fails first. Now, we don't always know what that weak link, weak link is. Some of us in the military like to think we don't have any, but that's wrong. We all have some. Now, let's take an example. You happen to produce more acid in your stomach than the average person. And you've been out several years. You maybe have 15, 16 years of service in at this point in time. And somebody who is your high school classmate, closest friend, maybe you played football or ran track together, somebody you trusted implicitly but you lost touch of, shows up at your door one day. And he says, Fred, it's good to see you again. I've been looking for you for about two years, and I finally run you down. I need somebody I can trust. I've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. How many times have you had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? Obviously, only once in a lifetime. Has he got his attention? Sure has. Well, what do you want? Well, look, let's sit down and have a drink, and let me tell you all about it. I have been in mining for the last few years, and I have a rare opportunity. Have you seen what's going on in the gold market? A lot of fluctuation, but gold today is selling for 11 times what it did just five years ago. And one thing we know about human nature and psychology is that as rough times come and go, the one thing that always has value is gold. It's part of the human nature to value that yellow substance. And I can take control of the Sunshine Gold Mine Company in Idaho. We'll have our own gold mine. Now, I need a partner I can trust. I will do all the management. That's what I've been doing all these years. All I need from you is a little financial backing, and we'll split the take 50-50. Well, you ask a few questions. You know, you don't want to act like you're really stupid about this, but you're hooked. Once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's a guy you used to trust. So you're going to very quickly find those warm feelings flooding back. You're recalling all those good old days. He may have given his neck for you, saving you on a football field sometime way, way in the past. So you believe in him. And finally, you sign on the dotted line, even though the price that he quotes means that you have to get a second mortgage on your house. You have to cash in all your life insurance for its cash value. You have to extend your line of credit to its maximum, sell all your stocks, withdraw all your savings. But you do that because you trust him. And you give him his money, and off he goes. Now, if you've never subscribed to the Wall Street Journal before, you will now. Not for the daily stock quotations, but for all that intelligence they have about the market. And by gosh, day by day, it's one piece of bad news after the other. It seems like there's nobody in the world that has anything good to say about gold. In the first week, the price falls by $30 an ounce. The next week, it's even worse. And you can't believe it. It seems like every issue, there's a conspiracy out there to drive you wild about the bad news in the gold market. Week after week, 
Bad news after bad news. Now what do we have operating? The stress, the worry, the anxiety over the investment. The context, well, it's pretty damn relevant. It took you 15, 20 years to earn all the stuff that you just invested in your best friend. 20 years of sweat, toil, and labor went into that. Is that relevant? You better believe it's relevant. The vulnerability, remember that acid in his stomach? By now, he's got an ulcer. See, that strain didn't go away. The worry was with him day after day, week after week, and now month after month. Now, about six months later, he's sitting down to take his Wall Street Journal, but he's prepared himself. He's taking his pills and his milk for his ulcer. And he opens up the Wall Street Journal very gingerly, and he goes page by page. And it's not too bad an issue this time. Really, it doesn't have any mention of gold whatsoever until page 43. The Wall Street Journal is not a sensational newspaper. And so these kind of items, they bury way in the back. But on page 43, lower left-hand column, he sees a certain little item that catches his attention. The name of his friend in caps. He seems to have disappeared with all the liquid assets of the organization and his 19-year-old secretary. Now what happens to our good friend, Fred? Well, we've gone to the big leagues now. The stress, not only do we have anxiety, but he's got anger. There is no greater anger than betrayal. That's really big. Relevancy, it took him 20 years to earn all this money. How long is it gonna take him to earn the same amount? Well, he may not have another 20 years. He's over the hill, some people are saying. You've heard the song, 40 and Faded? That's, that's old Fred. That's pretty traumatic. Vulnerability? Well, it's hard to predict, but now you're in the big leagues. You've multiplied all those other factors by about 10. So this is where you have the nervous breakdown, the stroke, the heart attack, and the suicide. That's how you become a stress casualty. Not all stress casualties are that bad. It can range from the ulcer to the final act. These are some typical examples of stress casualties. That list is not all-inclusive. Modern research is showing day by day that things such as allergies are affected by stress. Hearing loss, I got sensing loss down there. Something that's been diagnosed for years is nerve deafness. In a number of cases, actually is related to stress. If you take the individual that has the hearing loss out of his current job and put him in kind of a pastoral setting for a few weeks, within a month, he will have a 20 to 30 decibel increase in his hearing. Put him back on the job, and two weeks later, he's deaf as a doorknob again. What we're talking about and describing here is the chemistry. We're talking about powerful chemical forces that are inside you operating. And under that strain of stress, anger and anxiety, the most powerful emotional forces that you can undergo, your body convolutes. It's powerful, and nobody is immune. So let's reconstruct now how this operates in your life. From the moment you get up in the morning until you go to bed at night, you go through an infinite number of life situations. Some of those produce anger or anxiety. And whenever those emotions are experienced, strain occurs. You do have changing mood, changing blood pressure, changing heartbeat, changed chemistry in your body. And if that's prolonged too long, you will have ulcers, heart attacks, strokes, but you'll pay the price for prolonging that stress. Let's talk about life situations. I said there were an infinite number of them that you experienced during the day. Well, let's look at a few of them. I chose five because they're the five that you probably wouldn't choose yourself. And yet, they are the source for all of you of a great amount of the anger that you carry with you, anger and fear. All of them have those components in it, some more than the others. But of those five, the most significant one is change. I've passed out a little piece of paper that you can use tonight to evaluate the amount of change that you have in your life right now and give you the ability to anticipate what kind of stress impact it has on your health. Doctors Holmes and Rahi of the University of Washington developed this scale almost 15 years ago. As doctors at the University of Washington, they 
observed that there seemed to be some relationship between the amount of change in people's lives just before they were hospitalized and the health of their patients. So they set out to see if they can formalize that. They identified 43 major changes that occur in most people's lives and were able to assign a scale of impact to those changes and develop a tool for anticipating whether you were vulnerable or not. And that's what this is. Now, why is change so important? Change involves both emotions, anger and anxiety. Whenever we change, we go from a known to some form of an unknown. And man seems to fear the unknown just instinctively. So the element of fear is there just because we don't know how much better off we're going to be after the change occurs. I think you've all experienced that. Every time there's a change, something happens. Well, something else goes on in change. We are, as human beings, spend a great deal of time and energy structuring our lives to make it as predictable as possible. We don't like surprises. Surprises can be good and bad, and we have no control. So after we invest all this energy, it's kind of like going to the beach and building all day long this really magnificent, beautiful sandcastle and having some bully come by and kick it over. How do you react when somebody messes up your sandbox? You get angry. Somebody just blew your investment. So anger and anxiety go hand to hand with change. How do you use this scale? Well, you go through the items one by one and you look at the last 12 months of your life and take each item individually and try to determine the number of occurrences. Your frequency will either be zero or some number. You multiply the frequency with which that event occurred in your last year times the scale value, and that gives you your score. So if you were unlucky enough to marry twice and lose two wives in a year, it would be 2 times 100 equals 200. If it was zero, you lost no husband or wife. And I would include in this modern day and age any live-in type relationship, lover, whatnot, that has the same emotional impact on you, somebody you're getting that much emotional support for on that line. <coughs> If it was zero, it's zero times 100 is zero. And you do that with every one of these. When you're through, you total up all the points that you've accumulated in that far right-hand column. And if you have less than 200 points, you have a relatively low level of change in your life, and there's not a very good probability that you're going to suffer for it. If you have from 200 to 300 points, there's a 51% probability that you will become a stress casualty within six months unless you intervene. And if you're over 300 points, that probability is increased to 85% that you will be a stress casualty within six months if you don't intervene. And that can be anything from ulcers to a nervous breakdown, depending on what your own condition is at the time. So this is the way that you can predict what the impact of just change is in your life. But that's only one of those life situations. And let me go on to say that going down the bottom of the list to illustrate the impact of some of those situations. Let's take vacations. Everybody loves vacations, right? That's what we look forward to. So why is that on the list? That's when we're supposed to go out and relax. You know, you dream of fishing off the coast or in trout streams up in the mountains, skiing at Aspen, Colorado, or something like that. Well, on most vacations, we don't take them alone. In my case, I, there's a family of five. I've got three kids and a wife. Now, all of us in the military realize that you don't go on a month's leave without some notice. It's very hard to get a month's leave. And if I want a month's leave, I've got to tell my boss about six months in advance. Hey, we're going off for a month to the West Coast, and we're going to have a good time and all that good stuff. And I tell my family, they, we've got to make sure we're all available on the same dates. But we really don't plan too well on vacations early on. We kind of reserve that planning to the other end of the time. So for four or five months, everybody knows that we're going to take a month's vacation, we're going to the West Coast, and that's about it. So immediately, every member of the family does something that's peculiarly human. It's called fantasy. We fantasize about what that vacation will do for us. And depending on what we value most, we're either dreaming about fishing in the mountains or surfing off the coast or laying in the sun on the beach, but every person in the family has his or her own private fantasy. And let me emphasize the word private, because something else unique about humans is we don't share our fantasies. If there's one thing we have that's private that we embrace and hold dear to our bosom, it's fantasies. Now, what are we setting up? 
Well, fantasies soon become expectations. And by the time the day to leave occurs, everybody has a pretty rigid set of expectations about what they want out of that vacation. But have they shared those expectations with anybody? No. And are they likely to be shared by anybody? Again, no. Then there's something else that happens before we even leave. Somebody is the stucky. See, somebody has to take the responsibility for making reservations, seeing that the car is fixed. Have you got enough gas? Have you got enough cash? Are all the reservations made? Somebody has to see about the packing. If you're going to the beach and don't take your bathing trunks and all the other paraphernalia, when you get there, you're in for a rude surprise. So somebody having the responsibility has to see to these things, and that ain't a lot of fun. It rarely is. Now, what happens if something goes wrong in an area that you're responsible for? We have a thing called accountability. If you're supposed to pack the bathing trunks and you don't, what's my reaction when I find out? Anger. Then if you've shared this experience and gotten the family car, you know, that little confined space that we all start out a trip in, we notice as we drive down the driveway and out the entrance to our subdivision and wave goodbye to our house that everybody is euphoric. There's good feelings all around. But within an hour, they all fade. And you hear it in the kids in the back seat that as they're going along, they just they feel so good they can't help but let some of their fantasies slip out. Boy, when we get to the beach, I'm going to surf all day long. Who talked about the beach? Aren't we going to the mountain and trout fish? Those reactions are setting in. Within an hour, you've got a raging war going on in the back seat. Now, they'll never own up to what the real cause of the war is. Johnny just hit me, or somebody's taking more space. He's got my pillow. That's not what they're fighting about. They're fighting about the threat to their private fantasy that's entailed by the communications that are developing in the back seat. If you do what you want to do, I can't do what I want to do, and I don't want to go on this damn vacation unless I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what it's all about. And have you heard people come back from their vacation, sit down at their desk and say, God, it's good to be back. I can relax. Vacations can be the most traumatic time of the year. Christmas is the same thing. Look at our expectations in Christmas. It has nothing to do with religion as far as these expectations are going. We have 85-year-old guys who wonder every year in November what Santa Claus is going to bring them on December 25th. Totally irrational, yes, but the expectations are there. Somehow, Christmas is supposed to bring all those warm, fuzzy feelings. Everybody you haven't heard about, everybody you ever loved, it's just going to be warmth, warm, touchy feelings. Great time. Our expectation is there. We're entitled to that. Do we always get it? What's reality? Reality is that not everybody comes home. Reality is that other people have their priorities and their dreams too. So a lot of people wake up on December 26th with a sour taste in their mouth. And as a matter of fact, in that short period between December 25th and December 31st, we have more people die in that six-day period than any other seven-day period the rest of the year. Some people just live for Christmas, and once they've experienced it, they have no reason to go on. Expectations, anger, anxiety, bound up very much. A lot of family fights occur over the holidays. Just too much emotion. So those things are down at the end of the list. So you can imagine the impact of some of the other stuff. So that's change. Let's go back and touch briefly on some of the others. Why do I say they're so subtle? Why wouldn't you notice these? Rivalry. That goes all the way back to your earliest childhood experiences as a newborn baby. See, a newborn baby needs three things to survive. It needs to have food, you all know about that, but there's no problem in giving a baby food. Parents are incentivized to do that because they don't like to hear the baby squawk. You know, that really gets on your nerves. So you usually are stuffing something in the baby's mouth all the time. Baby has to have rest, that's number two. Well, for mama and daddy to get together anytime, they gotta get the kid in the sack. So there's an incentive normally to get that kid in the sack and get him to sleep, whatever it takes, pacifiers, food, whatever it is, shut the kid up and get him to sleep. So newborn babies have no trouble getting all the sleep and food they want. The third thing is affection, and that's where we have the trouble. See, newborn infants don't have a great deal of experience to call upon. They sense that they need to be loved, but they don't know by how much in order to survive. But they do know that if they don't get enough, they're going to hurt. So when you're in that situation, you don't gamble. 
You go for it all. You want all you can get. You'd rather have too much than too little. And that's the way the baby looks at the world, particularly towards its mother, who for the first six months is its primary affection source. Well, as you were born, if you had brothers and sisters, you suddenly had rivals for that mother's attention. Because the brothers and sisters may have not given their mom and dad the time of day for seven years up to that point in time, but as soon as that baby's in the house, they're clinging vines again. They sense that the newborn baby is a rival too. And they all go back to that primal need for affection, and we have competition. And you all have some perception in your mind of whether you are a winner and loser in that first encounter with sharing affection. And that has given you an emotional bias that has been reinforced by every experience you've had ever since. Did you always get the girl? Did you always get the guy? You've had some losing experiences along the way, and those are the ones you remember because they were the most painful. So any time you go into a rivalry situation, you already bring up a great amount of emotion from your past. And in the Army, we have all kinds of rivalry situations. We run this institution based on rivalry, competitiveness for promotion being the primary one, for recognition, that's part of our game. And so there's that feeling there. Do you like to be to lose? Do you like to wait for that list to come out and not see your name on it? Heck no. Because the other thing about the Army is we make it public. Everybody else knows too. So you can't even hide your failure. More people fail than succeed every time a list comes out. Conflict brings forth anger. Can you ang argue on any subject that means a lot to you, lose the argument, and keep your temper? Few of us can. See, we identify our own selves with our beliefs, and when we're arguing about something that means a lot to us, we're actually trying to defend ourselves. And if we start losing that argument, we treat it as a threat to ourselves. And when we're threatened, how does the body gear up to defend itself? Anger or anxiety or both. And when that happens, the chemistry in your body changes, those strains are occurring, and you're feeling them. You may not admit to them, but they're there. Also in the Army, we have a great deal of conflict. It's inevitable. And yet, we go home from these conflicts at the end of the day, wondering what it is that's burning in the pit of our stomach. It's the residue of all those chemical changes that have occurred all day long that are the outgrowth of all these encounters, wherever you've had conflict. Ambiguity. You don't define yourself by the face you see in the mirror every morning. None of us do. We define ourselves through the feedback we get from the people in the world around us. That's how we define ourselves. Ambiguity is kind of like a fuzzy picture. It's the lack of that clarity, of that sharpness, of that definition. That's why job descriptions are so important. That's why performance appraisals are so important. But actually, we only have job descriptions and performance appraisals for about a third of our life. The other two thirds are never defined somewhere, and we're floating around frantically trying to grab those descriptions out of relationships with friends and other people. So ambiguity really makes us angry. It's kind of like, to give you an analogy, the guy who goes out the Friday before Super Bowl Sunday and buys a brand new one of these projection TV things. The guy says, hey, I can't get it delivered till Sunday morning just about before noon. He says, as long as you have it ready by 1 o'clock, that's all right. Cost you $3,500 for that TV set. But you're such a proud guy, and you're in such anticipation of the game, you go down the neighborhood and you invite everybody you know to come and watch the big game with you that afternoon. 12 o'clock. 12.15, and finally the truck comes, and boy, you were starting to get in a sweat. The guy brings the set in, they set it up. Now it's about 20 minutes to one. The game starts at one. We're ready to turn on the switch, and all you get is snow. The guy fiddles around for another 10 minutes, nothing but snow. You look out the window, and you can already see the people coming in. You got a fuzzy picture. That's the same as ambiguity. How do you feel? At first, you're pretty angry. You know, you paid 3,500 clams for this thing, and it doesn't work. 
Secondly, your whole face is at stake because you've got the whole damn neighborhood that's going to watch come in your door and see what a, you know where you were. Brings forth great emotions. The same thing on ambiguity. Anytime the picture you expect to get of yourself is not reflected in the feedback you get from the people around you, you get uptight are entitled to have a clear definition of who you are. Look at the number of books that have been written on identity in the last few years. We all know what it is and we're entitled to it. And if we're not getting it, I want mine. Or else there's something wrong with me and that makes us frightened. So that ambiguity. We'd like to know where we stand, who we are. We like to have ourselves validated. We are important people and we want somebody else to recognize that. Sometimes just saying it to ourselves is a little like whistling in the dark as you walk through a cemetery. They're in a lot of confidence in it. We need that root and responsibility. Responsibility is kind of a funny thing, and those of us in the military experience it most often. What is the fear of responsibility? And that's what it is, is the fear. What's at work here? Well, actually, if you turn to the craft trades, you can see very clearly how it's illustrated. In the engineer business, which I am, particularly with facility engineers and construction type folks, we find that craftsmen such as carpenters, plumbers, skilled laborers of that nature, are very clannish. They, their primary friends are usually people that are other carpenters or other plumbers. They have a great deal of pride in what they do, their skill, and they get recognition among each other for that skill, for their level of achievement. And they value that very much. So much so that about half the guys that are plumbers or carpenters will turn down a promotion to foreman, even though it means more money. Are these guys nuts? Well, let's look. You see, you as adults still have three basic needs that you had when you were a baby. You need rest. You can go and sleep deprivation experiences, experiments, I think about oh, 60, 70 hours without rest before you go into a coma. You can go without food, I think, about 63 days, some, that experiment they have running in Ireland for a while there. I think one guy made it 63 days without food before he corked off. But what about affection? See, we need rest and food. We understand that. But what about affection? Well, adults pretty soon get to thinking that's kind of kid stuff. We don't take a good inventory of our need for affection. And yet, if we had the perfect wife, the perfect lover, the perfect husband, that person could only provide, if he were perfect, 40% of our affection needs. So where do we get the other 60% or more? Because I'm not a perfect husband. <laughs> where do we get the other 60%? From friends, from other people in our lives, on the job and not. Now, affection is kind of a funny word. It doesn't mean romantic love or all of that. It means social contact. It means feedback that validates us as a person. And if you don't have that, you feel a threat to yourself. And it's very real. It's biological. It's an imperative that you have that. That's why people who have too few sources of affection in their lives become neurotic. That's the danger of the people they term as loners. They become neurotic. They become mentally ill because it is a requirement. So let's go back to those trade people. Who's providing their 60 or 70% of affection needs? Their peers. Okay, you and I grew up in the same neighborhood. We go to the same schools. We graduate from college together. We are each other's best friend. We have a historic relationship of strength that's been nurtured through thick and thin crisis and joy for 20 some years. We go into the same corporation, and we're working our way up. He's in sales, and I'm in marketing. And as you go through, he's the star in his field. I'm the star in mine. We get promoted within a couple of months of each other. Our incomes are always very close. And years go by, some 20 years, and in a pyramid organization, ultimately you reach the point, he's the vice president of sales, I'm the vice president of marketing, that my shoulder's on one side of the pyramid, his shoulder's on the other side, and only one of us goes to the top. The big day is coming. He's entitled to that promotion, right? He's worked hard. In fact, through his sales, he has brought this company to new heights of productivity and genius and income. 
Because of his ability in sales, we are employing five times the number of people we employed just 10 years ago. He is a genius in sales. He can sell refrigerators to Eskimos. He can. And he's earned that promotion. He's worked hard. He has given his all to the company and to his community. He is a pillar in our community, loved and recognized by all. His wife needs a new coat. He's got two kids in college. He needs a new car. He deserves that promotion, not only the recognition, but the pay that it brings. Well, that's all well and good, but I also think that in marketing, I've done pretty well myself. I, too, am a rising star. His sales would have been nothing if I didn't create public demand for our product. I made our product a household word all across the country. He couldn't have sold anything unless they knew about the product, and I'm the one that told people about our product. Because of my genius, we are the second ranking corporation in our field in the United States. 85% share of the market. My wife needs a new coat. I've got three kids in college, and I need a new car. And it's only right that I get that promotion. And since I'm telling the story, I get the promotion. Now, what's he feel? A little bit of betrayal. He feels angry because he should have been recognized. He was entitled to the promotion. It makes no difference that I was his closest friend or anything like that. He knows in his own heart that he deserved it. And he's disappointed, and he's angry. He's angry about something else, too. He and I have been friends now for 35 years. Is there anybody in this room that thinks now that I'm his boss, that our relationship is going to stay the same? Is there anyone here that believes that? That's right. You relate one way as peer to peer, and another as superior to subordinate. So what has happened to him? He's just given up some share of that 60% of affection need that he's become dependent on. Well, how do I feel? Well, you know, I don't feel all that good myself. In fact, I may feel worse than him. Oh, I got the promotion. I got the money. I got the recognition. But I, too, gave up something. And I don't think it's very fair that to get something I'm entitled to, I have to give up somebody who's been so important to me for 35 years. I don't think that's fair at all. And I'm angry. I'm furious. And another part of my being furious is somebody's going to move into my slot in marketing who will become his peer, and he has a chance of forming a friendship with. He has an opportunity to replace me. How many other presidents of the corporation do we have in that company? I don't have any peers. I don't have any place to turn to. I may be giving up that share of my affectionate need forever. That's why people turn down promotions. It operates in all of us. Most of us never sit down and take stock. Now, if you're an E4 going to an E5, there are a hell of a lot of E5s in the Army. There are a hell of a lot of E6s. But when you get to E7, E8, and E9, you find the numbers at any installation starting to thin out. And then you start to find that, hey, Maybe life isn't so much fun anymore after all. So that's how these things going through your day can cause you, just by their occurrence in life situations, to experience anger and fear that cause all these chemical reactions and you carry them home with you at the end of the day. And those people who know you know that they're there. Now, some of you are going to chuckle about this. I'm going to talk about midlife crisis. This is a particular phenomenon that occurs and brings out the anger and fear in all of us. Now, the younger folks here don't believe this will ever happen. The older folks here may have already gone through it and may have a knowing smile and say, oh, okay, I understand that. And some of the rest of you are saying, geez, this is what's happening to me today. Well, it's an important time. Gail Shee, in her book Passages, is the one who probably popularized this term. Identifying that final passage or right in maturing as an adult, when you finally have to come to terms basically with your own mortality. Now in the service we know about mortality and the fact that a 20-year-old doesn't really believe he's going to die. That's why most of our Medal of Honor winners, the guys who throw themselves on grenades and all those kind of things, are basically pretty young folks. Why do they do that? Aside from all the heroic impulses and value judgments, they do it because in their heart of hearts they really don't believe it's going to happen to them. 
They'll believe it's going to happen to you. I can believe it's going to happen to you, but I don't think it's going to happen to me. It's not real yet. It's intellectual. So if properly led and properly motivated, you can get young people to take ridiculous risks because they don't believe it. The only 40-year-old Medal of Honor winners we've had are guys who didn't throw themselves on grenades or charge machine gun nests. They got it for being in a dangerous place at a dangerous time and performing well. I'm not trying to knock them, but they didn't do those really astounding feats of bravery that the younger folks do. And in fact, most 40-year-olds or older aren't going to get themselves into that situation. And why? Because they know. They know. And they're also a little cynical. They've seen enough of life, so they believe that if anybody's going to get it, the odds are four or five to one, it's going to be me. Therefore, that's the worst case, as far as my own self-interest is concerned, and I will do anything else but accept the worst option. I'll find a 20-year-old to do it, or I'll get us out, out of harm's way. That's the way we operate. Well, that's pretty traumatic, that change of our view of mortality. When you get into your late 30s, early 40s, friends, relatives start dying off on you. You're very much aware that it's going to happen to you. And that brings forth a feeling of anger in almost all of us. In fact, virtually every person at some point in time either wakes up in the night, it may hit him while he's driving, but he comes to that realization that in fact he is mortal. That this person that he's been working on to learn to love himself so very hard and just finally gotten to the point that he kind of thinks he's a neat guy, you're going to die and nobody asks you about it, you don't get to do anything about it, you're totally helpless about it, you didn't get to vote on it, and nobody can give you a rational reason why you can't stay here forever. After all, you're a swell guy. And you feel furious. Some people scream, some people do bizarre things, all in the anger and fear that results. We deal with the fear through spiritual means, religious, if you will. We don't deal with the anger. We still feel the anger of this. Sometimes that anger burns for 10 or 15 years while you're coming to terms and accepting it. But you get furious at your own helplessness in that situation. And all these other things go on too. That's kind of give you a feel of what you're experiencing as you go through that 35 to 50 time frame. Now, about 80% of the people make it through that period without any special recognition. They screw up a lot. They destroy their marriages, their family relationships, their other things. They do all kinds of insane and strange things, but they ultimately make it through it. And on the other side, we describe them as being wise, serene, accepting. They're nice people. What makes them nice and why we like to be around them is that they're comfortable. They don't make us uptight. I don't care what's going on, they seem to make you feel calm. They make you feel like, hey, you know, there's some place to go in the future. They're people that you kind of like to model just because they're so damn comfortable. They're the people that you can be on the other end of this. But boy, they paid their dues getting there. And what about the 15 or 20 percent that don't make it? 48 percent of our suicides are in that age group, 35 to 50. 48 percent of the suicides. I mean, that's a very traumatic period to go through. So on top of all of the other things we're talking about, here is the 15-year period of enormous emotional adjustment, bringing forth strong feelings. And is it any wonder we have so many ulcers, so many health problems with that age group? Your probability of living to 90 is about three times that if you're already 60 than it is if you're just 40. See, that's how traumatic that period of time is. There's no guarantee you're going to make it to 60 even. But if you get there, you've gone through the troubled waters, and it's downhill. You can coast. The major challenges are over. This is a tough time to go through. And we have people who run off to the Rockies to become painters, abandoning careers that were very meaningful to them. People that go off to California to discover their navel or whatever it is that they're looking at at that time. We have gals that leave their husbands and families and run off to find out what they would have been if they hadn't met him. People do all kinds of bizarre things. There's an attempt to run away, to escape it. But wherever you go, you take your 40-year-old body with you and the problems of just growing old stay there. You have to come to terms with them. How do you start over? See, when you're a 20-year-old, you can fail 
and do it again. When you're a 40-year-old, you got a lot of fear. You got a lot of people defend, depending on you. And you don't know that you can start over and make it again. Your options are severely limited. And that way, everything you do seems to carry so much more weight. And society adds to this pressure. When I turned 40, I was discovered. What do I mean discovered? Well, you know, people in the bank, people in the chamber of commerce wouldn't give me the time of day. You know, I was just some, you know, transient out in the crowd out there on the streets, and they didn't care who I was or what I did, just as long as I spent my money. But when I turned 40, they started showing up on my door. I got engraved invitations to things in the society I never thought I'd join. And what was the message they were giving to me? Well, now that you're 40, you're responsible and you've arrived. Now you owe us. It's time to pay back society for the free ride we've given you. We want you to be an alderman in the church. We want you to head up the fundraising committee for this. Head up the community drives, Red Cross chairmanships, Boy Scouts, coach athletics. Not only coach them, but head up the league. There were more demands on my time than I had to ma time. Now, at first, it's kind of ego gratifying. Hey, it's kind of nice to be important. What is this being an old guy seems to carry some fringe benefits here. Folks kind of think I'm something. Well, what they thought I was was a sucker, I think, because the demands kept coming in. There was no end. There were more people asking than I could ever give to. What does that do to you? Well, after a while, after the glow phase, you start feeling like, what's wrong with me? How come I can't cope? Seems like every other 40-year-old is active as hell and doing all these things. What's my problem? After a while, you can become neurotic about that. You've got all these problems, demands by your children, and if you think small children make demands, wait till they get to college. Wait till they get out on their own. I got a 19-year-old son that's out on his own, married, and boy, he causes me more anguish than, than he ever did when he was still in the home. I worry like hell about him. It just seems these things weight you down. And then there are some people who suddenly say, I'm not coping. I may be better off dead than alive. And there's something in our society that can make that argument convincing. If you were to take out a 45 and blow your brains out, what would the insurance companies pay? Nothing. Cash value of what you've invested. Was, you'd get less than 2% on what you put into them all those years. However, if you get behind the wheel of your automobile and go tooling down the road and hit an abutment, what are they going to pay? Double indemnity. Tradoc safety is one of my responsibilities. All ground safety and Tradoc and range safety and Tradoc in the Marine Corps. And looking at accident reports over a number of years, there is a disturbing, disproportionate number of fatal accidents of people in the 35 to 50 age group that occur under ideal weather conditions on isolated highways at prime times of the day. Alcohol may or may not be involved. They're never ruled suicides. But it's very hard for me to understand how some guy at 1 o'clock on a bright day on a three-lane highway can be traveling at 95 miles an hour and hit a concrete abutment that's 47 feet off the road. Unless he aimed for the son of a gun. We kind of reinforce that sense of failure. And only the neurotic will respond to it, but there's a lot in this age group that can make you neurotic. So understand the impact. That's just one more pressure that you're going to feel. <clears throat> then we have in our military our own environment. Every one of us chooses our career for a particular emotional reason. It's not rational in all cases. Why do you come into a military environment? Well. Here's what it is. It is male-dominated. It's bureaucratic. We wear our rank on our collars or our sleeves. Everybody knows where he stands. You talk about feedback, validation, lack of ambiguity. That's what the Army promises you. It makes you feel like you're worth something. If you come from a background where you didn't know whether you're worth a damn or not, and nobody would tell you, you come into the Army and we'll tell you. We'll give you an MOS and we'll tell you how important you are. Not only are you important to us, the guys that are leading you and all that, you're important to your nation. 
You're one of those guys that's standing between tyranny and freedom. You're one of those guys that joins the long line of people who have paid in blood for the kind of life that we live today. That makes you important. If we didn't have guys like you before, we wouldn't even be here today. So it gives us that sense of worth and identity. All of those things are there, but it also does three other things for us. We value self-control. We force you to suppress your anger and your fear, because it's not very macho, to tremble or blow up under pressure. And we value your so-called ability to carry stress. And in fact, some cases, we think we have got to go out and create some just so that we can show how well we handle it. That's kind of like burning off your hand to show how well you can take pain. Of course, the fact that you only have one arm afterwards, people dismiss that point. That's some of the danger of our highly structured military existence. And that's part of the problem that we as a community have with stress, is that our very system encourages and values self-destructive behaviors. They don't have to be. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about how they don't have to be. Now, how did I get into this game? Let me tell you a little bit why I'm doing this. I told you I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm an engineer and a soldier, and I became a victim of stress. About 12 years ago, I was on the command list to get a battalion. I got my battalion, and I got it because the promotion list was going smooth, slowly, as I was a major. As the only major battalion commander in the U.S. Army Europe in the early 70s, when we had all kinds of problems over there, 7th Army and USARA were getting not the best of the cream of the crop because the best was going to Vietnam. We were under strength, underfunded, and all of that. It was a real management challenge. And as a major competing with lieutenant colonels, I felt a great deal of pressure to perform. So much pressure that, in fact, I was neglecting my family, and my wife and kids decided, hey, you go on and do your thing, we're going to go off and do our thing. We had a separation. We had a big battalion test, and you all know what those things are, but for commanders of battalions, that is the key to whether you become a colonel someday or not. It's succeed or fail in one three-week period. Everything rides on that. The pressure got too much. I was bending over in my desk to get something out of a drawer, and I couldn't straighten up. They carried me off to the hospital just like that, four people carrying me in that awkward position. I could not move. I was frozen. Cervical arthritis is what they said it was. And while a doctor was talking about laying open my spine and reaming out the spinal column, I was talking about how can you get me straightened out and get me to the field? My troops need me. Now, you know better than that, but I didn't. I needed to be there for my report. So I finally convinced them to shoot me full of cortisone and Novocaine, put me in a brace, and in a brace that came from my crotch to my chin, I was helicoptered out to the field. Now, I want to impress my soldiers. You know, you guys don't want to see a cripple coming off the helicopter. So we landed in the clearing, and it was about 75 yards to the edge of the clearing. I was going to run, show them that I may have a brace, but I was physically fit. So with my head up about that angle and in a brace, I took off double timing across the field, stepped in a hole, sprained my ankle and my knee, wrenched my back again. They came out and picked me up off the ground, carried me back to the helicopter, and flew me back to the hospital. For the next three weeks, I was flat on my back. And for the first time in my adult life, I was helpless. That had never happened to me before. I couldn't even go to the bathroom by myself. And that's the time for stock taking. The cervical arthritis, stress-induced. And basically what they told me is, hey, you got to change your life, young man, or you ain't going to have one. You're going to be dead before you're 50. Because while you may think you can burn that candle at both ends, you got a short candle to begin with. That's just the life. Now, in the military, we have a particular philosophy about the physique. This right stuff type philosophy. If your body falls down, fails on you, obviously you weren't cut out for this life, and we should put you in the garbage can and let them carry you away. There's that philosophy about it. Any failure you have is less than perfection and somehow not manly. Well, that's a bunch of bull crap, because every one of you sitting here has a physical limit. You just haven't abused yourself to find it yet. But if you keep on abusing yourself, you will. That's the problem. Well, I learned some lessons from that. And I 
changed some of the things that I did, and I'm going to describe those changes a little bit later, and developed a certain philosophy. But I didn't practice it too well. And I ended up, mill percent in 1974, after my command tour and all of that, assigning people all over the world, a great deal of stress because I was sending guys off to Vietnam who were getting killed, and it does bother your conscience a little bit when you're doing that. And one day, I suddenly was walking down the hall, and I collapsed. The world was spinning about 90 miles an hour, just like that, and I started throwing up, and I couldn't even stand up. This particular disease they call as labyrinthitis. And I still have occurrences of that to this day. Stress-induced. Again, I found another limit. Well, I went back to the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, where I attended in 1975-76, and I did formal stress research. Found out what it is that operates in all of us, and we're all alike. We're the same basic chemical biological structure. And found out what it was, these things I've been telling you, that causes such damage in human beings. And then developed kind of a model for dealing with it myself. I was fine for another three or four years, <clears throat> healthy as could be. In fact, now that I knew this stress game, I got so proud of myself, I would go to annual physicals with a triumphant expectation, because I would take those parameters from the blood tests and urinalysis that they give you back, and I would go back to my first commissioning physical, and you know, I have the cholesterol count of a 22-year-old. I have the blood pressure of a 22-year-old. Magnificent. I was giving myself a self-examination, a comparison between a 40-year-old body and a 22-year-old body, and staying the same. I was not growing old, and I felt absolutely magnificent. That kind of emboldened me. I said, okay, now I'm on top of this stress game. I'm playing my rules of life a certain different way, and I can really go out and do more. I found myself working seven day a week, 17 hours a day, traveling from coast to coast, and just loving it. And I had my annual physical a year and a half ago. Again, the parameters were magnificent. There's no reason, Colonel, that you can't live to be 105. Your body shows no signs of deterioration. A little gray in the hair, perhaps a few wrinkles here and there, losing a little bit on top, but you're in pretty good shape. Three days later, I was in intensive care. They thought I had a heart attack. And I have an abnormality that's developed in my heart. Stress. See, you can know the rules, but knowing them isn't enough. You've got to follow them. And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to tell you the rules, what you have to do, to deal with it in your life. The choice is yours. You younger folks aren't going to believe me until you're flat on your back someday. What I'm trying to do is that when you get to the point while you still got a breath left, that you will remember and recognize what we said here and realize you have the power to change it. And nobody else can. First is in the organization. Not everybody can change organizational stress. But organizations themselves can produce a lot of anger and anxiety. And in fact, a lot of the frustrations that we feel can be eliminated by just taking some of the unnecessary stresses off the job. If you know you're putting people in aggravating situations, test. Are they really essential to the accomplishment of the mission? And nine times out of 10, they ain't. They get there by tradition, by habit. And habits are hard to change. When we identify stresses on the job, it's change them. Ambiguity, you know, that's where, again, you guys are supervisors, and everybody in this room is a supervisor in one form or another. Make your directions clear. Get with your subordinates. Let them know what you expect of them specifically. And when they're following up or not following exactly what you want, tell them then. Don't build up a whole bunch of hate for the guy before you explode at him. Tell him when you first notice the deviation, because he needs to know where he stands with you, and you need to know where you, he stands with you. Get it out in the open. Things like that. Don't make one guy do all the work. He's going to look around at all the other loafers and get hacked off ultimately. And yet sometimes, for just fear of whatever it is, we dump on the real good performers and let some of the other guys get by. And you all know that's a traditional problem in the military. Change the work environment. Find out the things that are the big hassles and go in and fight like hell. If you need adequate lighting in your work area, you need adequate ventilation, you need adequate tools, get them. Keep fighting for them till you get them because the impact on your workforce 
is really significant. People get furious over a period of time if they're not given the right tools to do the job. The only way you can appeal to a guy's pride and self-respect is letting him really self-aggrandize those things. Let him really actualize himself and realize the maximum he can do. But if you give him a bum tool, he can never do that, and that just frustrates the hell out of him. And it's your fault, not his. When I say increase participation, I mean basically <clears throat> let people know what's going on. Recognize that fear of the unknown is a fear. And the more informed people are, the less fear they have, the less anxiety. And the less anxiety they have, the better the relationships. In management lectures that I give, I make the statement that relationships are the primary tool of management. And anything that causes anger or anxiety interferes with relationships and has a devastating effect on management effectiveness. That's why we need to keep people informed. Otherwise, there is anxiety. But essentially, let's look at you. What can we do about you so that you can save your own life? Live longer. We have to eliminate the anger and anxiety. One of the first things we're going to look at is the stress of self-assessment. There are a lot of things that can give you accurate self-perception, but we've got a scale here that will let you go through and find out just how well off you are, not only in change, but across the spectrum. And you take this home tonight, and again, you're kind of looking at the last year. You take that Holmes Rahi thing we did, and the first item, depending on the number of points you got on that, you integrate those points using this system into the overall stress assessment. Then you look at your diet. And depending on what you do daily, give yourself the points accordingly. And as you work through this thing, you find great numbers of areas that you can give yourself points based on your diet, your behavior, your style of living. And you finally come up with a total score. Now, all of you will have over 25 points. That's not necessarily dangerous. It means, though, you're in that area of the population that is vulnerable. If you have over 50 points, then you have to be concerned. Over 50 points, you're in the high probability that you're going to be a stress casualty. It may not happen tomorrow, it may be four years from now, but you will be. You are burning up the engine of your body faster than you can replace it. And ultimately, you'll find what your limit is, and when you exceed it, you're in trouble. And of course, this thing tells you where the high point areas are. Sometimes it will be diet. We tend to put too much salt and sugar in a diet. We tend to smoke too much. We tend to take too many pills. Those are the kind of things we look at. Look at your behaviors. Behaviors just covers a wide range of things on how you live. I use a couple of things. One of them is a stress checkup to, to illustrate behavior. <clears throat> and what this does, and it's something you have to do with somebody who really knows you, a close friend, somebody who will be honest with you. You know, we can all BS ourselves. But we all have friends who, when you say something about yourself that's a little bit out of line, says, hey, Charlie, that's not true. You know damn good and well you don't feel that way. Who will make you own up and face up to the things you are. Well, that's the kind of person that you need to work on something like this with. I lecture every year to the Army War College. And the first year I went up there, I was in a seminar, which enabled me to deal with some of the husbands and wives. Now, the Army War College is supposed to be our best officers that are picked, and this is where we're going to get our generals from and all that stuff. So they're a pretty hard-charging group. And I used this exercise. I said, OK, guys, I'd like you to tell me what's the most important thing in your life. And they thought for a minute, and immediately guys' hands come up. They're very competitive. They like to get a lot of recognition and attention. And they said, God, duty, country, honor, all those value things. And I said, whoa, we're off base. That's a bunch of crap. You know, what are the things that you'd schedule your day to do? Those are value systems, but if you really, if God was the most important thing in your life, you'd have been a priest, not a soldier. So let's get back down to reality. Again, what are the most important things in your life? And then they sit, and then guys start looking at their wives, and finally one guy just can't stand the pressure. He raises his hand, jumps up, says, my wife and family are the most important thing in my life. How much time did you spend with them last week? And boy, I've just thrown a hand grenade in the room. 
Everybody titters around, nervous, everybody glad that I didn't call on them and put them on the spot. And this guy looks at his wife, and I never understood why. She knows how much time he spent with her last week, and she's either accepted it or gotten even, or she wouldn't have been there. What's his problem? Well, let me phase his problem. In the front of his peers now, I have just sandbagged him because he already perceives, if not consciously, subconsciously, that I've really put him on a management spot. And I'll illustrate that. If I tell you that a certain report has to be done by 5 o'clock Friday and it's going to take two full days of your effort, but my job and your job may depend on the outcome, and come Friday at 5 o'clock, you haven't prepared the report, and not only that, you didn't spend any time on preparing the report, how long are you going to stay in this organization and will we have a friendly relationship? Not at all. You have failed because you can't get the result without investing time and energy. Now, if your wife and family are the most important things in your life and you suddenly say to me, two hours, sir, last week, you only gave two hours out of the week to the most important thing in your life, you must be a pretty crappy manager. And you've just admitted that in front of everybody. Because if you don't put the investment of time and resources into your goals, you're going to fail. And the only excuse for failure you have, since you control your time and resources, is I'm either incompetent or I lied. How many of you want to stand up and say, I'm incompetent? Do you like that title? Well, what about standing up and saying, I'm a liar? Do you feel more comfortable with that? What's this guy feeling in front of all these peers now? Like a complete ass. I have really nailed him because we've well, just put him in the boat that he's either incompetent or a liar. And who put him there? He did. And he just boils inside. He's furious with himself. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but we all do this. See, on our jobs, we are a little better management than we are in our personal lives. How many of you really can consciously say what your personal goals and objectives are for this week, next month, next year? in your personal lives. Do you really know what's important? And more importantly, do you schedule your time so that you can achieve it? Do you keep telling your wife or your lover or your husband that something's going to be done, it's really important, and then never do a thing about it, and then you wonder why the heck he or she nags you? I mean, you've put yourself there, and you get irritated with yourself. You're waiting for that other shoe to drop. You know you're going to fail. That's just a fact of life. If you have an objective and put no resources or time or energy towards it, you will fail. That's a law. So why do you do that to yourself? And that's what we're doing with this. Let's find out. Let's force you to look at that thing because right now today, you are getting in human relationships into situations where you're feeling angry and frustrated by the fact that you backed yourself into that corner. We all do that. We're just not used to looking at it proper sense of responsibility. Self-aggrandizement is kind of a, a nice thing to have. We all like to show off, particularly the people that we care about. I was a district engineer in Florida where I have a public works responsibility dealing with federal officials and with the civilian community. All federal water resource needs that are funded by the federal government are administered through the district engineer. And I would get on TV and be interviewed and I would sometimes be very tempted to overstate my responsibilities. To show off is what another word for calling it. So a reporter might say to me, well, Colonel, uh, in water resource in South Florida, just what is your responsibility? And I would come back and say, I am responsible for all water projects in South Florida. Well, then, why are we having a drought in Palm Beach? Well, now, I'm caught. Because first of all, what I said was only part true. <clears throat> By law, the state government is responsible for allocating drinking water and water supply. I am only responsible for flood control. So I opened the door to get nailed by overstating my responsibilities. Now what do I do? I either have to take the hit and responsibility or accountability for a drought that I have no control over and no responsibility for in actuality, or I have to stand up, well, just a minute, I lied when I talked to you before. <laughs> It's a no-win situation, and we do this all the time. We kind of like to expand our responsibilities, and we get ourselves in trouble, and there's no retreat. You're sandbagged. That's why you've got to be very careful. Be honest. And it saves you all that worry. <clears throat> Limitations. 
Remember I talked to you about that right stuff on physical limitations. We like to all think that somehow we can all run three-minute miles. And if we can't, it's either a lack of training or a lack of will. And when somebody runs a three-minute mile, we'll go for the two-minute mile. Somehow, everything is achievable. There are no physical limits, and that's pure crap. And you've got to know what your limit is. Now, actually, in limits, it's a funny thing. There are three real limits. There is your actual physical limit that only God knows. You don't know it. There's what you think, you think your limit is based on your expectations, which is usually a little bit beyond your physical limit. And there's what your friends think your physical limit is, which is always way short of what it actually is. <coughs> Now, if you've got to listen to one of those, since you don't know the one that God won't share with you, you only got two to choose from, which should you structure your life around? Yours or your friends? Your friends. Because the thing about limits is well defined, is if you exceed it, you break. It's too late. And the only way you find it is by trial and error, and that's a tough way to do it. But we're not prepared to think in those terms. And so you tell somebody that he has a limitation and he really gets uptight. I can't own up to a limitation. That's going to look bad on my performance report. But we all have it. It's a fact of life and you've got to live with it. When I talk about how do I react to disappointments and losses, I'm really coupling that also with how do I cope with stress and anxiety. And then let's turn right now to the stress symptoms thing which accompanies your stress checkup. And what we're trying to do on this is give you an indication of what some of your behaviors are so that you can judge how well you're coping with the daily stresses of life, angers and anxieties. People have said that if all Americans could have problems that were catastrophic in nature, we would have no trouble with stress because we handle catastrophes greatly. That seems to be something in our nature as Americans which is unique in the world. We can have a major earthquake. We can have some of our citizens imprisoned by the Iranians for more than a year. And they handle it beautifully. But if somebody dents your finger fender in the parking lot, if the traffic light gets stuck, if you hit the railroad crossing when there's a 194 car freight train going through at two and a half miles an hour, those things just drive us out of our mind. Those are the things we can't handle. And when we come home at night and we open up our newspaper to read the sports pages and there's a one inch tear in the lower right hand column of the newspaper and we stop, look at it, swear and then have an hour temper tantrum about that tear, what is that telling your wife and family? You ain't handling stress and anxiety very well today. That's what it tells them. And you need to get that feedback. And these are some of the symptoms when you have two or more of these, that those levels of aggravation are building up inside you and you ain't handling them very well. And you need to take stock. Six, seven, and eight are to force you to do an inventory of the affectional relationships in your life. There's a quantitative and qualitative aspect of it, and it's important that you understand that. Richie is a guy, for some reason, I think he's a handsome guy, and I would really like to get to know him. I don't know what it is in his personality, but I want to be his friend. We really have no interest in common, but every Saturday afternoon, I'm working like crazy to try to share some time with Richie. My wife thinks I'm really nuts, investing all that time in a zero relationship because he could, wouldn't give me the time of day. He actually is annoyed every time I approach him, but I've got some neurotic need that I feel that I have to relate to this guy. Parker over here, he and I both know we like fishing. Parker has the access to a real nice trout stream, and he needs somebody to go fishing with. It's more fun to go fishing with the companion. And he can't understand why every Saturday afternoon when he invites me to go to the trout stream, I say, no, I want to go over and visit Richie over here, and he thinks, I'm an idiot. Well, I may be, because in meeting that 60% deficiency, since I say I've got a perfect wife, for my affection needs, I have to turn to somebody else. I'm trying to get something from him, but I'm giving four hours a week to zero return. When this guy is willing to give me maybe only five, 10, or 15%, but even if it's one half of 1%, it's infinitely greater than what he's willing to give me. It's got to be neurotic. It's not my interest, and some of us do this. And what we're trying to structure is let you do an inventory. Find out who are the people who are meeting the affection needs in your life. 
and how much time are you investing in them because an affectionate relationship has to be reciprocal and how much are you getting back and letting you then prioritize your time give zero hours to the guy that will give you zero return give your hours to the people that give you the return you will be happier and your life will make more sense in fact I'm creating a hell of a situation with all my friends and my wife by continuing to bang my head against this stone wall over here but you know there are some people who we somehow feel that our own self-respect demands recognition from them and we go after that that we don't feel validated unless that specific person recognizes it sometimes it may be a fixation on a movie star if only Sophia Loren will write back then I will feel like I'm a person and we will go to any lengths we become obsessive about these things but it is a neurotic pattern and it usually is the indication that you have an imbalance in your life in those affection areas and it needs to be corrected and the way to correct it is to inventory it and then take the corrective action coping behavior and what triggers anger and anxiety go together the next thing we have is a personal stress inventory in order to eliminate anger and anxiety in your life you got to kind of find where it is that causes it now I've tried to identify some 30 situations that you might feel like are things that cause you to feel angry or anxious during the last year if they are just put a check mark by it and that's the starting point these are the things that pull your chain now if you say oh I can't remember what makes me angry I just don't have any idea and you have kids you're in luck ask your kids every child knows how to pull his old man or woman's chain that's part of the training they have in the sand lots after school you find out what makes your old man blow his top yet well try this why it's a manipulative device if somebody can make you angry not only do they do you a great deal of harm they divert your attention from something else it's a way of controlling your attention now why do kids do it well have you all seen how we have such humor around that first bad report card a kid brings home hundreds of cartoons all kinds of short stories and situations jokes and anecdotes about kids bringing home their first F or D and how they go to great lengths to either hide the card or avoid the confrontation say they have an unknown event standing out there threatening them what is old, my old man going to do when he sees this primarily what is he going to do to me and I'm convinced it isn't going to be good therefore if I can go and get him angry at me for something I know what the punishment is I will take that because it's known rather than risk risk what I don't know and I also know that if he blows his top at something I manipulate him in he's going to feel so guilty about it later that he's going to be easier on me when I tell him the truth manipulative the point is that if you got these triggers to your emotions out there certain events or things make you angry right away you have given control over your very longevity to external events and you need to recapture that control and this is an exercise to help you find that but then you need the next one which says how do I cope with stress because here I tried to identify common coping mechanisms now the blanks that I left on the other thing is to fill in what are the situations that you know are specific to you and I left blanks on this one too one that you might add to this list on coping mechanisms is eat a lot the last one I listed was drinking a lot a lot of people every time they get angry or anxious about something they start lifting the bottle some people go to the ice box and start stuffing their face those are all coping responses these are common ways that we think we convince ourselves anyway that we're coping the question is what is our definition of coping and that's the key to this list I'm going to give you another definition of coping since I have defined the stress process as a chemical biological process the strain mechanism in your physical body the definition I would pose is that any behavior or action that reduces that strain can be called coping any behavior or actions that has either no effect on that strain or increases it obviously is not coping by that definition everything on this list is not a coping mechanism these things here will not cause your blood pressure to go down your heart rate to slow down your respiratory rate to slow down 
extract the adrenaline from your bloodstream or any of those things. And in fact, a lot of these things just prolong the impact of the stress. So let's talk a little bit about coping mechanisms. Anything that reduces or eliminates the strain would have to be coping. Now, there are two ways to go about this. One is prevention. If you prevent the feeling in the first place, you don't have to cope with it. And secondly, how you reduce it once you got it. And that's what we'll talk about in the rest of these. Communicate and listen. Part of problem in avoiding things is don't get in the situation in the first place. I've got another poop sheet that gives you Sperry Rand's list of good listening habits. <laughs> A lot of our problems come from poor communications. Not listening is one of those, and that's why I put listening as the most important one. You can listen without agreeing with what's being said. It's possible to get the message without agreeing. Just the fact that you hear it doesn't mean that you agree with it. Some people get mixed up on that. Leveling, what do I mean by that? I'm walking down the street and I run into Joyner here. I haven't seen Joyner in 10 years, and I grab him, I even embrace him, I hug him, and I say, God, it's been good to see you. I've really missed whatever it was that I know about him in the past, and I talk about some anecdotes from 15 years ago, and I lead you to believe that one of the highlights of my day today is running into you. And you leave our contact fully expecting to get a telephone call or an invitation shortly because of the warmth of my regard. You didn't realize you were such an important person in my life. A few minutes later, I run into Kirkbride here, and I said, I just ran into that Joyner character. You know, oh, I almost puked. It's the worst thing that's happened to me all day. I really didn't handle it very well. I was so shocked by seeing that nerd again. Okay, this is an exaggeration. But it's to illustrate something we do in communications. I didn't level with one or the other. But you know what I will do? I will invest a heck of a lot of time and energy seeing that this man and this man never get together. And even if it's beyond my control to prevent it, I will then wonder and worry for 20, 30 years waiting for the other shoe to drop. What's going to be the reaction to what I've just set up? I've started something and it's a threat to me because either you or you are going to find out that I'm a liar. And that's going to affect both relationships. See how we set ourselves up. And you've got to be careful. Level with me. That doesn't mean you have to be what they call brutally honest. You don't have to be brutal at all. You can always be nice, but send the right message. I could be very polite and run in to say, join here again. Hey, it's been a number of years. I don't have to say it's even good to see him again. What has it been? 15 years? Well, how you doing? And then break it off and go on my way. That can be just as polite, but it also sends a message. He walks away understanding we've had a casual encounter and that's all it was. No doubt about it. Some people just feel some need to BS themselves into all kinds of trouble. Then they sit and stay awake at night waiting to get caught. You, know, you don't have to have that in your life. Using your anger. Listen, I'm going to talk more about anger now than I am fear because I think we deal with fear pretty well. Those of us in the military especially, we're trained somewhat to deal with that, but we aren't with anger. In my last job in Florida, I had to issue permits to virtually anybody that wanted to do anything in Florida because under federal law, most of the lands in Florida, some 25,000 square miles, are called wetlands. And to do anything, you have to have a fill permit from the Corps of Engineers. Some of the people had had a lot of money at stake. And I had one guy with a multi-million dollar investment in property. He had applied for a permit and I had denied it. He'd already borrowed the money at about 15% interest. We're talking maybe 30 or 40 million dollars. That's a lot of dough. And then I said no. I wiped out his dream. Now I expected him to be angry. That was not a surprise to me. And I also expected him to come confront me. After all, I'm the one who just wiped him out. He was entitled to come up and have me ra 
rationalize it to him face to face. And so he called for an appointment, and I made the appointment. He showed up at my office absolutely hopping mad, beat red in the face, livid with anger, came in my door shouting obscenities and abuse, which went on for about five minutes before I could get a word in edgewise. And I said, look, Mr. So-and-so, why don't you go back out and cool down? And when you're not so angry, and as soon as I got that out of my mouth, he said, God damn it, I'm not angry, and broke the top on my desk. He hit it so hard. He, here's a guy that was about 54 years of age, and he's not angry. He's about to have a heart attack on the spot. Some of us will deny that we're angry. But why? It's a legitimate emotion. Mother Nature put it in us. It's there to defend us. If we didn't have it, we'd get wiped out. Why deny it? The thing we have to watch is our behavior when we're angry. Not the emotion itself. That's okay. You can't avoid being angry if you're threatened if you try. The only time you'll ever stop being angry is when you're dead. Never before. So you got to recognize when you're angry or you can't even do anything about it. But recognize it because inside, if you'll think when you're angry, all the churning emotions, you can feel that chemistry bubbling away in there. It's like somebody poured acid in there. It might as well, it's having the same impact. And the longer that feeling lasts, the more permanent damage is being done. That's why you need to recognize it. Displacement of anger. I can take any one of you guys as a colonel and just bring you in my office and chew you up one side and down the other for something that you didn't do and probably get away with it, as long as I don't do it too often. You all know how the system works. What can you do? Can you fight back? It's not in your enlightened self-interest to do so. So that's a luxury that I have. You all have it with your subordinates. We all pay a price when we do it. But once in a while it happens. I may have been in that same situation, and somebody has taken a red-hot poker and jammed it up the place where it hurts the most, and I got to get rid of that feeling, so I pick on you. You're more of a gentleman than me. You go back to your office and you steam all day long, but you don't take it out on your subordinates. You're a better man. You go home that night, and you're like a five-pound can with a 25-pound force, and you're walking up the driveway, your wife comes out to greet you, and the first thing she says, hey, Parker, you forgot to take out the garbage. Whap! You catch her right aside the face. Did he want to hit his wife? No. He wanted to hit me. Actually, at the time he hit his wife, he thought he was hitting me, psychologically. It had to come out. In families where that happens, and it happens too often, she knows she can't fight back, too. She wheels around and heads for the kitchen where she left a four-year-old sitting at the table. You leave a four-year-old at a table long enough, and you'll have your pretext. And sure enough, he's taken the top off the salt shaker and has made a little trail across the table. Whap! He catches it. He leaves the table knowing that the best antidote here is to leave the scene of the tension. And he heads down the hall for the bedroom, looking for the dog or cat. Unfortunately for humans, but fortunately for animals, animals are more perceptive than humans, and they left the house as soon as he got home. <laughs> so what we see along the baseboard going down the hallway are little indentations where those four-year-old shoes take their anger out on the wall. Displacement of anger is one of the, should be a sin. It's one of the most atrocious things we can do because we normally displace our anger on the people we care about most. The guy who wrote the song, You Only Hurt the Ones You Love, really had it on the beam. You only hurt the ones you love because nobody else will put up with it. And that's the tragedy of it all. So whatever started, which you never know why I got angry, it started a sequence of events that are destroying your very existence. Not only the personal price you pay and the anger you felt all day and what it does to your body, but what you're doing to your own relationships of the people you care about most. Displacement is one of the worst things we can do with anger. You don't have to respond to the anger of others. Is anger contagious? Anybody here thinks it's contagious? It really isn't. There's no virus involved. There's no bacteria. What makes it contagious? Now, I have to say this, that sometimes I like to feel a little bit angry, particularly if it's righteous. You see, when it's righteous anger, you seem to have goodness on your side, 
And when I get a little bit of this righteous anger, I think I stand about a half inch taller. I know my stomach comes in and my chest goes out. I just feel more decisive, more forceful. So I might let somebody else's anger trigger mine if it's justified so that I can actually show off. That's really what but I'm paying a price for showing off. I have taken somebody else's problem and made it mine. I didn't have to do that because it is not contagious. We choose to be angry if somebody else has got a cause or we choose not to. As long as that element of choice is there, choose not to. Deal with it another way. Somebody breaks into this taping session, I might have the reason to be angry. They're going to mess up my sand pile for a while. I might have the reason, but I don't have to choose to be because I can see that it's his problem. And I know from my own research and experience that a better way of handling it is in invite the guy in, set him down, and let him work it off, and we'll get back to normal very quickly. But shortening my life because he has a problem is not to me a rational solution. It is not a coping solution. How do you use anger energy constructively? How do we model it? Well, there's something unfortunate here. When a child is born and growing up and just a toddler, it can get itself in all kinds of harm. And one of the first places we perceive harm is that red hot burner on the kitchen stove. Somehow that attracts nice little hands. There's a magnetism about that. I have never found a sociologist or psychologist will disagree with this statement. If I want the highest probability that my child will not burn his hand, then the first time that little hand heads for that red hot burner, I slap the heck out of it. That will give me the greatest probability the kid will never burn himself. Now my parents didn't believe in that philosophy. They believed that it was more effective to explain to me how hot a red hot burner was. Since I didn't know how hot a red hot burner was, never having been burnt by one, it was all academic, and ultimately I have a scar across three fingers of my hand where I one day found out that they were right. It was hot. Now, they were what they would be called permissive parents today, and as a result, I had a third degree burn on three fingers of my hand. My kids didn't get burns on their hand because when they reached for the stove, I powed them. And something else, when any one of your children is threatened, we treat it as a threat to ourselves and we react accordingly with both the fear and anger components. So what is the expression on my face when I see my child reading for, reaching for the burner? It usually is one of anger. I can't help it. That's the way God made us all. When we need to crank up all those resources to respond to a threat, that's one of the emotions that does it. So the child then equates anger and violence, some violent act. Well, then, depending on how you deal with a child in all other situations, that's probably reinforced. In 80% of the homes in the United States, corporal punishment is the rule of the day. When you're spanking your child, do you look happy and joyful? You usually look angry, because you usually are hacked off or you wouldn't be punishing them. It's in their own interest. Nobody's arguing that. But we're talking about a behavioral cause and effect relationship. Then the little kid turns on cartoons. How does the cartoon character express its anger? Fox and Roadrunner. Well, it's four or five pound sticks of dynamite, rocks drop from 400 feet in the air, you know, all those nice, you know, conversational ways of doing with it. Violent forms. Let's go to the sports scene. If you have a son, you want to start watching sports at age two and a half with a kid. So you turn on the football or baseball games, Reggie Jackson, when somebody throws the ball right close to his scalp, he's always very gracious. He goes out and tells the pitcher, I forgive you for that. I can understand that you lost your control. You think he's ever done that? Well, I saw three times on TV where he walked out and he piled the guy in the kisser. Guys that strike out with three runners on base and you're behind one run in the bottom of the ninth, they, of course, lay down their bat very nicely, put it back in the rack, go out and congratulate the winning pitcher and go back to the dugout. Have you ever seen that happen? I never have. Well, I've seen broken bats and thrown helmets and all kinds of things, but I've never seen that. The linebacker and the tight end. Sports commentators really like to focus on them. You always find that the linebackers and the ends always have a camera on them in the ball games. Why? Because they're the ones that are getting in on every play. The cheap shot to the face, the blow to the rib cage, the kick to the chin. I'm telling you, they all do it, and they catch every one of them. 
and they set the stage for you very colorfully, telling you about the history of these two people's relationship, and they hate each other's guts. And then they proceed to show you how they act out that hate. Can you understand then why nobody knows how to deal with anger energy very constructively? Where the hell do you learn it? But you know what research has shown us? There is a very effective way of coping with anger. The most effective way of all. If I am really furious about something and I come storming into the room and you happen to be somebody who I first trust, have some care about, but most importantly that I know is a sympathetic listener. What do I mean by that? That he will let me pour out my whole horrible story, lay it out on the line, and he will sit there nodding, listening carefully, getting everything I said, not acting bored or trying to change the subject, not intervening, but basically sending messages of saying, I accept what you're saying, you're still okay. You got a raw deal, or even if you didn't get a raw deal, I still understand where you're coming from and you're okay. Because one of the things when we're angry, we feel threatened, we're looking for reassurances. We're trying to get it all clear. And by listening to what I have to say, he is revalidating for me that I'm a meaningful person, that I have some worth, that my emotion is genuine, and that he's still willing to stay in the room with somebody that just went through this whole experience. After I've told him it all, within two or three minutes, I will feel better. I will find that all those symptoms, those strained things that were occurring in my body will go away. And then a few minutes later, we can actually start laughing about it, and then all my anger is gone. I may not have forgiven the guy who caused me to be angry in the first place, but he has helped diffuse it, made it healthy. Now, after my third sentence, if he suddenly says, well, you dumbass, you, it's all dead. He can do nothing more for me except stir my anger because he sends me a message of rejection that I'm not okay. And so I'm going to continue to carry that cross wherever I go. Where do we train anybody to listen that way? But if you have just one friend that can do that for you, it might add 10 years to your life. That's how important it is. Sometimes we need to have the courage to make changes that reduce stress. Sometimes you have to change jobs, change relationships, change careers. That's a tough thing to pull off. And this is one of the most important things of all. You have to take time out to get to know yourself. If you don't like yourself and know yourself, appreciate yourself, you are limiting your ability and your future. You know that you can discriminate between more than 40 flavors of ice cream individually. You can go into a perfume store and you can discriminate between more than 200 fragrances that are on that counter today. Each one has a distinct smell and you can tell the difference. You can pick up more than 300 varieties of flowers and also smell a difference. Your eyes, unless you're colorblind, I hope you're not, you can discriminate between more than 10 thousand individual hues of color. Your eyes have that capability. Do you know how magnificent you are as a structure, as a human being? Have you ever taken time to find out how many different tones and combinations of rhythm you can discriminate between and appreciate? The various <coughs> tastes, textures of touch. Have you ever had the chance to find out just how magnificent your sensing apparatus is? Because if you take the time to do these things and forget about the clock, you're going to get a high of a kind that you never experienced before. And what it's going to do for you is a very subtle change in your whole relationship pattern. Because as you learn to discriminate, which is to tell the dis differences between different touches, smells, and tastes of different talents and abilities, likes that you have personally, you're going to suddenly find that you're going to seek out people company who represent differences rather than similarities. Why? Because differences is what distinguishes us. That's what makes us unique. Not our similarities with anybody else, but our differences. Now, right now, almost everybody chooses his friends from a community of people who have a great number of similarities because we find difference threatening. If you suddenly discover that people who are different make you feel more unique and more alive, you seek them out just because they're different. Now, 
Are there more people in this world who are similar to you or different than you? And that gets us back to this affection need. You have limited the possible sources of meeting your affection needs to a very small minority of people in this world. If you change your attitude about that and cease, stop finding people who are different, threatening, you have expanded the potential number of affectionate resources by an infinite number. And you will actually develop those relationships. And then you become a different kind of person. Since you are not threatened by a lack of affection input, you're just more comfortable off the bat. That worry is taken off your shoulder. You have a support network of people who make you feel unique, good, valid, and needed. That has an infinite scope. And that makes you feel comfortable. You don't feel threatened. They can't take anything away from you. You have got a support network that is unique. And that's what we're talking about by this idleness that you have in your day. Give yourself that chance. Learn about yourself so that you can relate to people. And that will do a lot for you. These are major ways of restructuring your life. Stress reduction strategies. What we're going to talk about is limited, is already listed on a piece of paper that I've given you as personal stress reduction strategies. To formalize the things I've just been saying, you need to sit down and do the things on this list. And basically, write out your personal goals. Then you schedule your time and resources to accomplish them. Remove those sources of anger and anxiety. You identified where they are. Those, some of those you can get rid of. Just throw them out and take action to remove them. If something's hassling you and it's not needed in your life, it's just there by habit, it's no longer appropriate, decide to get rid of it. Remove yourself from situations where you have anger and anxiety. Now, I know in my group, lunchtime is a point. How many times do you go to lunch with some guy that just hacks you off? For God's sake, when you go to lunch and want to digest your food, pick an environment and people who don't hack you off. You don't need to have aggr aggravation at lunchtime. Give yourself a break. And you don't have to work at lunch. Lunch is a legitimate time for feeding and nourishing not only your body, but your whole system. Give it a time out. But some people like to go to lunch with the most controversial guy they know. And they come back totally hepped up. They haven't relaxed during lunchtime at all. They've got themselves so angry they can't deal with the next three people they talk about. Take opportunities to look at the people who aggravate you and limit, curtail your contacts with them. Increase your contacts with people that make you feel good. You have a lot of choice in all of that. <clears throat> now, there's a thing called conditioning. We have a great deal of power over our own behavior. I wrote a program that I think my parents gave me. If I had been a computer, and when I was a young man, my parents would have probably put in the computer instructions that said this. That's one of the reasons I'm a type A personality. And one of the problems I had when I turned 40 was this one here. I'll just use that as the illustration. The saying no. My mother felt that it was somewhat sinful for a gentleman to ever say no. There seemed to be an open invitation to anything anybody wanted to ask. And I couldn't say no. And I found that I was killing myself trying to do everybody else's work. I couldn't say no. What do you do about that? Well, I finally discovered a way to deal with that. We actually can pre-program ourselves. And how do we do this? If you'll take a three by five card, actually three of them, and write your reprogramming instruction. What do you want to change to be? Think about what you want to be that's different. And this is what I wrote. I have the right to say no to people. And you know what I did with that? I put one on my mirror so I would see it every time I shaved or comb my hair. I put one in the windshield of my automobile, so every time I got in the car, I would see it. And I put one on my desk. Miracles do not happen. Two, three months went by. I was reinforcing that message every day by looking at it, but I hadn't started acting on it yet. Every time somebody asked, I would agonize, but I always say yes. But one day, somebody came in and asked for something some time. And without a second thought, I said, no, I'm sorry. I'm interested in that, but I just have no time to do that this month or in the next quarter. The guy left, and I didn't even think about it, for almost 24 more hours. 
Then suddenly it hit me. My God, what had I done? I had just said no, but only had I not only said no, I didn't suffer for it. And I really felt good. It works, and it will. And if you have a subordinate that you got to deal with, but for some reason he just irritates the heck out of you, I've got some instructions down there how you can write a programming message to yourself that can change your attitude and at least your professional relationship. You don't have to like the guy to have him work for you. But you can deal with people you don't even like. You can restructure your attitudes if you want to. And find those people, those things that are happening, that are causing you aggravation, and if it's due to a program, some set of messages that either your parents or somebody else has given you, change the message. And finally, stress reduction techniques. These are the real coping mechanisms when you're already angry. you already got this load of aggravation building up during the day, and you want something that will follow our coping definition. Autogenic training is self-hypnosis. What do we mean by that? Well, okay, don't get excited. You can go to groups that teach you how to hypnotize yourself purely to relax. No tricks, no gimmicks, nothing else involved. The state of hypnosis is relaxation. And in that state of relaxation, your body will do what it wants to do in, all along. It will put all those parameters, breathing, blood pressure, heartbeat, at their normal state. It will reduce them. And that's why you want to do it. You can learn in a couple of weeks how to hypnotize yourself for three, five, ten minutes and do that during the day at moments you can get away, particularly whenever you feel those feelings welling up in you. You don't have to take the load of garbage home with you every night. This will help bring those parameters down. It does nothing for the cause of them. It only deals with the physical impacts that are going on in yourself, but it works. Whenever you give your body the chance to relax, it in fact will bring those parameters down. Why don't you relax normally? Because your emotions, those feelings of anger and anxiety, keep you from relaxing. They keep that stuff charged up. So what hypnosis does is it takes that conscious mind and puts a lid on it and says you can't feel for a while and it gives your body the time out. That's all it does. Biofeedback. Engineers love this. We've got some machines now that you can hook people up to and it can train you to relax. You can learn to, how to relax every muscle in your body, including your heart. I wouldn't advise that one, but all the rest of them, yes. And after about two weeks and probably about $400 investment, you won't need the machines anymore. And as soon as you know you're uptight, you can just automatically will yourself to relax. Not many of you will make that $400 investment, and you need to go through a doctor before you do that, and sometimes referrals are difficult. But it is a method for the really extreme cases. Visualization. Human beings have a unique property that we can recall past events in our memory and re-experience the emotions associated with those events. If you had a particular moment of fear or horror, you can recall that and have the same feel, fear again alive in your body as you had then. But also, if you had one of those supreme, sublime moments of pleasure and relaxation, you can recall that and feel the same emotion again. The trouble with a lot of us guys in the service, is what they call type A personalities, hard-charging people, who will say that we never had one of those moments in our life, so there's nothing to remember. But for those who can, it's a way of doing it. Meditation. Any meditation that uses a mantra does the same thing as hypnosis. It takes your conscious mind and puts it on something so benign, it's impossible to experience fear or anger emotions and lets the rest of the body do what it wanted to do all along, and that's relax. That's what meditation is about. Nothing spiritual or esoteric in it as far as the mechanics of meditation are concerned. Physical relaxation exercises. Relaxation and exercise are mutually exclusive. By definition, relaxation is the absence of stress, period, in anything. By definition, exercise is stressing your muscles. However, when you've had one of those particular aggravating days, exercising will take the edge off that feeling and fatigue your body so that it will be easier to relax. Physical exercise programs themselves are important for a healthy body. So, you need exercise as part of being healthy in the first place to reduce the vulnerabilities of the body to stress. Dietary programs. If every one of you would eliminate all the nicotine, all the caffeine, uh, all the alcohol, 
50% of the sugar and 50% of the salt that's in your present diet, you would reduce by 75% the probability you'd ever have high blood pressure. That's how important that chemistry is. Caffeine and nicotine are two of the most deadly poisons you can put in your system. We all have too much sugar, and everything is salted, and we all have too much salt. But most of you will find that impossible to do until the physician orders you to do it for life or death, so I won't say anything more about it. Group and individual training programs. Some of us just feel it's not okay to relax. However, if somebody else will flop on the floor and go like that, then it's okay and we'll do it too. So some people will do with a group what they're inhibited to do as a person, as an individual. The important thing is to relax. If during your day you don't take some time out and give your body a fighting chance to recover, you're going to pay a price for it. So however you relax, these are the ways that you can do it. You have to select the one appropriate for you. My message to you is to do it. Now let's talk about some myths. Let's take the first one exercise. There are some people who preach that if you stay in top condition, you can handle stress and will never have a heart attack. Any of you believe that? I'm glad, because it's wrong. All exercise will do will increase the probability you'll survive your heart attack. It has nothing to do with preventing it. <laughs> exercise is related to heart attacks like seat belts are to accidents. A seat belt will never prevent the accident. It may save your life when you have one. Physical conditioning will not stop the heart attack, but it may save your life if you have one. And don't let anybody convince you. Our study of heart attacks in the Army have been with people that are athletes and jocks. They're the ones that have the heart attacks because they're out so compulsively doing everything that they overdo everything, including the strain in their emotional lives, and that's why they have the heart attacks. Loading. You hear about good old Bill or Frank. Some of you who are that way, seen that way by your bosses. You may have some subordinates that way. The more I load good old Joe, the better he performs. So since I'm a humanistic, kind, loyal boss, I feel I have an obligation to load the heck out of Joe so that he optimizes his own performance. So I keep dumping on him, dumping on him. The problem with that philosophy, that makes it a myth, is that good old Joe has a limit. And his response to stress is a sine wave of increasing amplitude. At the peaks, he shows himself off to the boss. That's why the boss thinks he has that particular association. We all do that. You don't take your shoddy product to the boss, you show off to the boss. But he still has the shoddy period. And if you keep stressing him long enough, you will find that actual limit. And the trouble about the limit, as I said before, once you exceed it, you break. 80% of the people who survive that point where you found the limit, and a lot of people don't survive it, are never half as effective the rest of their lives as they were before they broke. That's the price you pay for that belief. But the vast majority of people have the strokes, the nervous breakdowns, the suicides, and the heart attacks when they find their limit. All the king's men and all the king's horses can't put Humpty Dumpty together again once he breaks. It's true. And watch the program. Dealing with things. Do not subject anybody who works to you to anger or anxiety needlessly. As you're just pushing them towards that limit. And finally, adapting. If I punch you in the nose and hit you again, how many times do I have to hit your nose before it adapts? It'll never adapt. That nose will be damaged every time I hit it. It will never adapt. Why? Behavior will adapt. Physiology does not. And stress is physiology in nature, not behavior. Behaviors help us reduce stress because the second time I come at his nose, he will rock his head back, duck, or run, or do something which we call coping. That's a behavior. But if he just keeps his nose up there and I hit it, baby, the damage is done. And that's why any training program that has as its basic philosophy, if we stress the heck out of somebody so we can adapt to it later, it's fallacious. It's a myth. 
You do damage every time, and all you can do is try to reinforce some self behavior that will cause a behavior that's coping in nature, you meaning ducking or running, by doing it. You're not adapting. The adaptation response is not adequate. It's not appropriate. Yet, too many of our basic training programs are based on the philosophy that people will adapt to stress. They will not. We need to concentrate on the sources of damage and train people to avoid them, to cope, but don't use the image or the language of adapting. This is the kind of guy we want everybody to be, and you all can do that. You have a wide variety of sources of gratification. You're not dependent on any one person or any one thing. So you're not threatened when any source is cut off. You stay flexible under stress. You bend with the wind. You cope with it. You duck when the blow comes. You recognize you have limitations. Yes, you do. That's OK. Because those are more than balanced out by your assets. Most of us have trouble listing our assets but we should be aware of them. By treating people as individuals, and when you get to know yourself, that discrimination aspect lets you treat other people as individuals because that's what you want to be. Our sense of identity comes in our uniqueness. And we get that by being treated as individuals ourselves and treating other people that way, and that by aut automatically will make you active and productive. Now, why have I spent this time with you today? to try to convince you that you're first important, that you are vulnerable to the things that I've described, I found out the hard way myself, and that's why I'm sharing this with you. But more importantly, to convince you that you're important in this society. Each one of you plays roles for people you don't even know, an important role. And our country can't afford to give up a quarter of a million of its best people every year, meaning people that have learned the tricks of the life that are reaching that age group when they can pay society back in terms of role modeling, leadership, responsibility. We can't afford to lose those people, and you're going to be one of those people soon. We need you, and by your behaviors, your attention to these details, you can extend your own life 5, 10, 15 years, and the quality of that life will be better because you'll be healthier. You will have better relationships, better self-concepts, and better abilities on the job. If you'll take charge of these sources of anger and anxiety in your life and either eliminate them, reduce them, and most importantly, learn to cope with them. Thank you very much.